So, today we are talking about PR 2.0 and putting the public back in public relations. And I have to tell you a, a little story. I was in Boston at the IMS, the Inbound Marketing Summit last week, and I was really jazzed to be on a panel to discuss PR 2.0, traditional news releases versus social media releases, and, and these are the tools that we use now. And two sessions before me, somebody, uh, one of the speakers, basically got up and on his slide, there was a huge Time cover, so it was Time magazine, and it said, PR is dead. And I went, oh, no, no it's not. And you know, I. I Purposely, when I got up on the panel, I, I had to tell everybody, PR is very alive. Uh, it's being reinvented. And he actually went to the, to the limits of getting down on the floor and resuscitating the PR person with the defibrillator. <laughs> so I do want to say that, you know, a lot of things have changed, but there's challenge, there's excitement, there's focus. I look at each and every one of you as a potential influencer or champion for your own companies or the brands that you are helping to support. And we just have to understand where are our roles and where are we going with this. So PR is not dead. It is just being reinvented. And the way it's being reinvented is through this new approach. We got very complacent, and I can even raise my hand and say that, sure, I fell into that little bit of a trap when you're working with a corporation and the messages, you're, you're asking executives for key messages, they're handed down to you, and what you pretty much do is you put them in your news releases, right? A lot of it is spin, there's some hype, technical jargon, and really the only people who like the news release are the people who signed off on it. Because when it goes to the media outlet, half the editors are like, oh, in the can, and if it goes out to the public, it's not a meaningful story. So we, we had to move away from mass. You know, you can't have one-way, top-down information that goes out. The social media and the social sphere is all about two-way communication. And the only way that we as people or our brand survive is to give consumers, your, your stakeholders, whoever they may be, something meaningful. You need to be a resource to provide valuable information. So no more top-down strategy messages handed from key executives, it's much more bottom up. And we are listening now. And truly, if you're listening, it changes our entire PR approach. And I'm gonna get to that. And the way that we connect with people, we're not just media relations. That's not what PR, it, it's one portion, it's, it's one of the buckets, and it's one way that we function. But it's not, we deal with publics. And PR is not dead as long as there is a public. So I'm, I'm here to say that. So we are ready and poised and through this new approach to earn newfound recognition. Okay, so diagram. Wow. Notice the big word in the middle. Gosh, there's a lot of noise. This is your traditional communications method. You basically have your source, you have your message, it goes through the channel, it's received, you get your feedback. But what happens is your customer, if you don't tell a customized story, whoever's receiving it, it doesn't mean anything to them. So they pass. And then all of this media saturation eventually just ends up in the middle as noise. And now in the social media landscape, the fact that we can all be content creators, I mean, how wonderful to be able to select what news we want, to share it, to write about it ourselves, it changes the whole game. And it's, it's a different landscape. So. If consumers are driving and really controlling their own communication, we have a new landscape. And it probably looks a little intimidating. Does it look intimidating? Anybody want to shake your heads? Yes, be honest. OK, so in the world of PR and the world of telling your business story, this landscape, it's here to, to help you. It's to give you options. When we tell a story, it's no longer, okay, get the news release, get the messages, pump it out over the wire. That's push, push, push. We don't have to do that anymore. There's a lot of pull. There's a lot of people who need the information, and if you customize the story, they really want it. So if you look at the diagram around the outside, you can see there's, you have your mainstream markets, you have your vertical markets. There's listening, key. There's learning. 
even before you participate. There's different <coughs> options you have when it comes to how you want to break your news or how you want to tell your stories. Now, some companies, they're going to break their news. They'll still go through mainstream. They'll spike the coverage. They're going to go to their primary newsmakers, and that could be your Wall Street Journal or your New York Times, and that's fine. Spike the coverage, secondary newsmakers get a hold of it, keep the momentum, overflows into the blogosphere because we know that media feeds the blogosphere and the blogosphere feeds the media. Or you can do it the opposite way. It's very easy nowadays to customize your story, get it to a primary influencer, and your primary influencer they're your bloggers who have thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. And you sort of go about it, you pick your select group, and maybe you give them the exclusive story, your breaking news, and then it gets to some of your other maybe magic middle influencers who they might have a, a thousand followers, but you know what? They have the potential to speak to a group that you've never spoken to before. So in business, we're not always invited into the conversation. When you get to this layer in a web community that's the magic middle, you have the potential to actually tell a really good story and have somebody respond, to have somebody want to act upon your story, to purchase your product or service. You have your, your tastemakers. That's another really strong influencer. They're the folks, and they're in every single industry, and you can find them. They're the ones who are so passionate about a, a product or uh, a type of movement or some sort of trend that's happening. And if you find these people, they will certainly, if they find value in your story, they will write about it on their blogs, they will tweet about it, the news will get out, their followers will pick up on it. So there's lots of options. And you know what? You can also tell your story right to your customers. And that, that's the beauty of the new approach. In 2.0, it, it's no threat to the PR person. It's not at all that your brand can tell a story directly to the customer. That's a great option to have. So there's lots of ways that we could navigate this tremendous new landscape. And it is a matter of listening first. If you don't listen, you're not going to know how to reach the right people and who are the folks that are really going to carry your story forward. So keep that in mind. Okay, does this look familiar to anybody, this diagram? Now, I know you can't read it, but this is, somebody tell me what it is. Okay, in the back. Um, it's basically all different, it's the breakdown of basically internet and when people actually use it. Very good. Okay, so what you have is a conversation prism. This was developed by my co-author, Brian Solis and Jess Thomas. This is a beautiful diagram, and really, it's the breakdown of every different type of social network that there is. And I'm just going to show you that so you can see it a little bit more blown up. Basically, what companies do is they're very quick to jump on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. I hear it all the time. We go in, and we hear their story. We do an audit, and they say, oh, well, we're already on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. And then we say, but why? Why are you there? What are you trying to do? Who are you trying to move your stories through? What, how are you measuring it? And how does it actually benefit and bring value to your brand? So the conversation prism is an exercise in going into different types of social networks. And, and here you have, you know, there's blog platforms, blogs and conversations. There's micro communities that you can go into. There's live streams. The other part of the diagram shows video communities, bookmarking communities. You have um, document communities. There are all different ways that you can share content and connect with people and connect with the people who are interested. And in, if you're taking a thought leadership approach, you know what? Why wouldn't you want to be in a document community where people want information on your particular area of expertise? So basically, you can go into any, I'll call it a pedal, of the conversation prism and use keywords around your brand, your products, your services. And Chris Brogan said this in his book, Trust Agents. When you do this search, put something that, whatever word it is that describes your product, and put community and see what comes up. And you'll be very surprised. Take a look at the conversations. This is how you identify in any one of these networks 
where you need to be. Now, let's just take it a step further. So, we have that, you saw the beautiful conversation prism. This is a grid that we use with our clients to map out potential areas. And this is a generic grid. So really what we do here, and I'm going to give you a slice so it's bigger, we start looking in places and searching for conversations. And certain social networks will pop up. And we'll say, OK, so we, we have a nice cross section of where we think we should tell a business story. But it goes beyond that. Your listening has to be so deep and so intense. And you know what? Because there are a lot of nonprofits in the room, that's scary, right? Because where are we going to get the resources? How many people do you need to be listening in these communities? Because ultimately what you want to do is you want to listen for the depth and the breadth of a conversation so you can move it to the next level to say, you know what? My brand really doesn't need to be in four micro communities. Let me just bring it down to Twitter and Tumblr. And I think that's enough. And that's just a, I guess, for you all to know that it's not the quantity. It's not, oh, let's be in 20 social networks and, and set up our platforms or profiles. No, you don't want to do that. You'd be better off in two. And if you can do a good job and you can grow your social media program, it makes sense. Then, as your brand seeks success and you see the rewards of what you're doing, you can certainly expand into more networks. So this listening exercise, basically what it does is it says, if you listen long and you listen hard, you can really let your brand know this is where you need to tell your stories and who are the right influencers who are talking about them. You would then go and start participating commenting on blogs, being a part of a community, so that you can actually enter the right way. You're not spamming, you're not selling, and it's all about relationships. So this is definitely one approach. It's listening, and Brian's quote, um, and I don't know if this is actually in our book or not, but what it does is it says it's the listening that really separates the social media theorists from the experts, because how could you be an expert if you're really not there tapped into your market and your conversations. So keep that in mind. Um, I wanted to show this diagram because this is another way of charting a social map. So your brand is in the middle. And of course, this one looks totally um, intimidating. There are many, many places where this, it, it could be yourself. Do this for yourself, actually. That's a great exercise. And I, I wish I had shown mine. Uh, if you put yourself in the middle, as you grow your own brand, and I know that Ed is very big on personal branding and the personal branding era, you'll see where is the right place for you to you know, start distributing your own content and talking about yourself. You can do this for yourself or you can do it for your company. And this is easy. You can use mind mapping software to do this. It's free, Inflow. Um, I think it's TouchGraph does this. So just some really cool technology and tools to help you along the way. Okay, I love, this is, this is actually Brian's latest tool that he came out with, he and Jess Thomas. Uh, anybody see this one? Is this new to everyone? Because it, it's, he just, I think, last week launched it. It's your social marketing compass. And I don't know, you probably can't see um, all of the little circles, but you can tell it's a, it's a vibrant, connected diagram. And this is your brand's chart. So you've listened. You know where you have to be. Your brand is in the middle. This is from who are the players and the platforms that you're going to use to how are you going to channel your content. And then on the outside, it's, you know, what sort of emotional sentiment are you putting out there? Is this about... Um, empathy, or is it about sincerity? Is it honesty? You know, how are you going to be perceived? So this is really interesting. You know, your players could be anybody. That's the, the yellow circles. That could be anyone from your traditional media who's out there in your, in your web communities. It could be um, advocates and stakeholders of the company. It could be your influencers from the A-listers to the tastemakers, you know, picking the appropriate influencers, moving to the next level, knowing what social networks you're connecting on, whether it's micro-communities or social networks or you're moving through mobile, 
And then what are you going to do with your content? Is it on the next level? Is it aggregated? Are you streaming your content? You know, is it user generated content? Is it crowdsourced? And then lastly, it's all about emotion and sentiment. So when you get to that level, think about it. Emotion and sentiment. Where do demographics fit in? They don't. This is about, and that's actually my next slide, this is very human. You're getting the feeling that this is all about human and people. And if we're talking emotions, we're not looking at age, sex, religion, um, income. No, because it's all about behavior. So you have to remember, this is a lot about sociology. And now, don't you all wish you paid more attention in your sociology <laughs> classes, right? I wish I did. So we need some brush up courses. But we're, we're looking at humans and the way that they interact. And this is key because, you know, I've studied my own blog communities. Um, Chris Brogan, I'm a very big fan of his. He is a social media expert. He works with businesses on their social media. I was watching his community for a very long time. I listened, I observed super, super smart people commenting. I watched how Chris treated his community. I watched how the community interacted with Chris. Then I loved to look at the comments to see how they were interacting with each other. That's what it's about. You're, you're talking about cultures, and cultures are really tight-knit. So every community you go into has a culture. You need to be one of them. You need to fit in. So this is really important to understand that in order to humanize your story, you have to make it fit with each and every culture that you're giving it to. Why does it matter to them? And, and how are they going to use this? How does it benefit them? OK, so the big question. This is the big question of the day. And you can just personally answer it for yourselves. Every change that's going on, all of this 2.0, especially in public relations, is this revolution or is this evolution? And I have my own personal opinions on it. But when we think evolution, we think nice, gradual, peaceful change. When you think revolution, ah, drastic, radical, pervasive. So, you know, sort of look at our new social sphere, you kind of get a feeling for both. And I'm going to walk you through some pictures just to, sh just to share rapid change and evolution at the same time. Uh, the traditional news release, has everybody seen one, read one, maybe not liked one? Um, in any case, traditional news release, we were stuck on this for a hundred years, and I'm not going to bash it. I'm not, because it served a purpose. But because our landscape has changed so much, you can't, you, it, it needs a facelift. And that's exactly what we did. We gave it a facelift, and even though the social media release, which is completely different, traditional news release is about messages, and it's a push. It's pushed out over the wire, it has a lot of reach, your social media release, the difference, it's a pull. It's pulled into communities. People can take parts of it, whether it's the video that's embedded in YouTube that can then be shared. You can, there's over 50 sharing, t on, on this particular release, this is, this is my book, Social Media Release, there's over 50 sharing tools where somebody, it's a pull. They can take it and they can share it on Reddit, Newsvine, Twitter, Facebook, you name it. <laughs> You can use it, and you can pass it along to other people who find it valuable. But believe it or not, there are a lot of steps in between. We didn't just wake up one day and go from the traditional news release to the social media release, because that, that truly, the, the approach is revolutionary, but it was an evolution. Because I remember back in 1990, 1998, we were just doing customer releases. We realized that, yes, we're going to pump out our news releases over the wire, but there are certain stories that we just want to post on our website for people to take a look at. And then we got into search engine optimized releases. And, and the wire services came a little bit up to date with this, where you were able to use bold, italics. You know, you had your keywords. You made sure that they were at the top of the release. So the search engines could put, pick them up a little bit more. We, we had another choice. There was a video news release where when you sent that out, you'd see your B-roll footage on the evening news. And then there's the VNR Redux, which is a VNR 2.0 news release where we look at 
quick video clips. We're not worried about the quality of the video, but it's getting the story and having that to share. And then you get the social media release. And basically, we have come a tremendous way. The Newswire services have evolved to help us because you can see they are, they're calling it social media release capabilities that they have where in their releases that still go out over the wire, there, there's the ability to comment, there's trackbacks, you know, you have all your optimized content, there's sharing tools, there's video. However, it's not a true social media release if it goes over the wire. That's the big difference. When you have a social media release, it doesn't cross the wire. It sits on a blog platform, and that's why you would use a PR web, or you would use, has anybody ever heard of Pitch Engine? Pitch Engine's awesome. I mean, that's a place where you can go, set up an account, build a free social media release, and if you want it housed in their newsroom, you would actually pay a fee for it. So here, you know what, in the approach, yes, the difference between the traditional and the SMR truly is revolutionary, what we're doing and how we're actually getting our story out, but it was a, an evolution because of all the different options that we had along the way. Okay, your 1.0 newsroom, oh my gosh, we, we were, you know, building newsrooms to make sure we had all of our news releases, there was the information to make sure that if the media came in or um, analysts were in our newsroom, they would find everything from fact sheets, backgrounders, photos, logos they could download, you name it, this was standard. And it, it did, it, it was the 24-7 area where somebody could come, it, it would be a journalist, and grab what they needed, not that they didn't need the PR person, but it was really helpful. Well, today, the newsroom takes on an entirely different approach. Um, and it's not just for the, your, your traditional media. You have everybody coming into your media center. And this newsroom, this is Global Crossing, you can actually speak to the experts on their blogs. Newsrooms are very 2.0. You want people to come in, you want them to comment, you want them to build a relationship with you right there. Find out what they're interested in so that you can share a much better story. And you can see the, you know, follow us on Facebook, we're on Twitter, find us on YouTube, here are our videos. This is a very, very different type of newsroom. Um, again, it has evolved. We've seen newsrooms take multimedia on. We've seen more video incorporated. If you were to compare the 1.0 to the 2.0, you might think that this is revolutionary. Monitoring is one of my favorites in public relations and, and in web marketing, how we're actually finding out, you know, where are our brands landing? Who's, who's talking about us? And believe it or not, in public relations, and I'm sure you all know this, we relied on a reading service for how many years? I just remember, we worked with JVC for nine years, and their biggest trade show is the National Association of Broadcasters. That's in April. But we started our pre-NAB, where we did the pre-briefings on all the product launches somewhere around February or March. And we would get a lot of coverage that one of the things that we always wanted to do when we walked into NAB was to have a clipbook for the president of JVC because it was an honor for us to hand it to him and say, you know, Mr. Yoshida, here's your clipbook, this is what you received. But we were at the mercy of the reading service because sometimes your readers, the clips came late or they didn't come at all and you'd have to contact the service and say, well, what about these publications? It's so different now. Could you imagine if in the social media landscape you had to rely on a reading service? And, and this is okay, this is still intact and it's used for certain very niche publications that perhaps need a reading service, but guess what? We have dashboards, we have real-time monitoring, we have reporting at the touch of a fingertip. This is Radiant 6. Um, they have a great river of news where you use your keywords, and you can key into trends. You can, you know, one of the diagrams there is, you know, how many comments or, or posts were done on a certain topic. You know, how, how, what were your bloggers talking about in terms of uh, whether it was your product that they were talking about or your competitors? You can track so many different things. And this really adds to when you're monitoring and you're listening, it adds to better relationships and connecting with people.
So big changes there. JVC's website with its 1.0 functionality at one time was, you know, mind-blowing. This was state-of-the-art. It had flash. It, it had areas where you could go in and, you know, get any type of information you need, types of demos. There was video. But it wasn't your 2.0 functionality. Not at all, because now, when you have a website, who's heard of um, the Google Side Wiki? Is anybody using it? All right, well, so not only are a lot of brands turning their websites into blogs so they can have the full functionality of 2.0, but actually anybody can go to a website and put comments, give your perspective on that page, add to it, add to the history. Uh, which is really interesting, making the social media universe and, and everything that's connected one big wiki, so to speak. Talk about the implications for PR. So this, right, this is revolutionary. This is so different. This is such a drastic departure from what we were used to and what we were managing. And it was very easy to manage the stories and update the website and know exactly how to time it with what was going on in the market in terms of the PR and the promotions and the product launches. Well, now it's a whole new world. It's an interesting world. It's a challenging world. And that is revolutionary. OK, this is my favorite because this is very personal to you and your own brand, whether you're a PR person, a marketer, whatever role you take, um, this is my, my personal years ago, what success would have looked like. 15 years ago, 18 years ago, you know, 21 years ago when I started in PR, media relations, getting those cover stories, making the CEO happy. CEO was thrilled when he saw something in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. But the difference, which truly is revolutionary for us, um, we're not just the handlers and the facilitators. Our role has changed drastically, and this is so exciting. When people say, well, you know, what's a public relations person going to do? I say, I'm not even sleeping at night. I have so much to do, and it's great. You know, what's the marketer going to do? Oh my gosh, what isn't the marketer going to do? So the success has changed, and not Media relations isn't going away. We will still facilitate and handle and be liaisons. It's a part of the role, but, you know, and, and that's a hybrid approach. That, that's the approach that I take. However, don't we all want to be influencers? We want to be champions, right? And what that means is climbing up the technographics ladder. And that's, it, it's a diagram that was developed by Forrester, and really it was based on consumer participation. And I do have a slide so you can see what's on the ladder. On the bottom rung, the very lowest rung, you have your inactives. And look at this all personally for yourselves. Because if you're in marketing, if you're in PR, if you're in a company, and you want to be a champion and move your company forward with social media, you can't be on the first rung. No way. There's no inactives. You don't even want to be on the second rung. Uh, my dad, who's 81, is on the second rung. He is. That's the, um, the spectator. And he does. He enjoys watching his YouTube videos, and he listens to his podcasts. Um, and I'm actually I'm moving from the bottom up, sorry. <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking at it like the ladder. So the inactives is on the bottom, then the spectators, then your next rung up, that's the joiners. That, that's better. That means you're participating. You actually, you're dipping your feet. You made some profiles. You're talking to people. My mom, she's 75. She's a spectator. And she is on Facebook and Twitter. And that's why my teenagers don't want to be there. If she's there, they're like, get grandma off of Twitter. So you can understand why the younger generation, and statistics just came out. The young folks, they're, they're really not, they don't want to be on Facebook anymore. They don't want to be on Twitter because 35 and older, and, and my mom <laughs> is there. Um, collectors, next step up, really important. They love to share information, which is really great. It's your sharing your RSS, maybe through a Google Reader, um, your bookmarking and tagging so your community can see the articles and the blog posts that you like. Next step is you're reaching your champion level. You become a critic. Yes, you become vocal. You're not scared to, to participate and to say how you feel. You're reviewing, you're commenting, you're um, 
you're saying, I like this, I don't like this, and you've taken on a whole, whole new realm. And then as your true influencer or champion, and when you get to this level, this is the level that you understand the dynamics and that you can actually educate on it. So we all want to be educators because we all want to give back, and, and it's important to do that. So as a creator, as a champion, guess what? I create my own content. I am doing my own WordPress site, uh, uploading my own video. You know, I know how to manage my own content. So that is the true champion. So hopefully all of you, and it doesn't matter where you are on the ladder, you have to learn to move yourselves up so that you can help your brands to move up the ladder. And it all makes sense. Okay, so this is the 1.0 IT department. And this is really important because the role of the marketer and the public relations professional, my goodness, we used to have to wait. And I, I love the IT department. I have no problem with them. I think they're great. But we had to wait until after lunch to get something posted. And if your news release goes out over the wire or you have something, an important story to tell, you don't want to wait for anybody else to post it. So today, guess what? My marketers, my PR team at my agency, they're all using SharePoint. Okay, they know how to work in the SharePoint environment. They are taking team sites, they are building blogs for our clients, you know, managing those blogs, uploading videos to the blogs, working the wikis, we built the wikis, putting in interesting content, you know, helping to guide the conversations. We never speak on anybody's behalf, but it's a whole new realm. It's, it's a role that, as a PR person or a marketer, that we just didn't take on. We know WordPress. We work the back end of content management systems, so our clients can say to us, you know what, you fix the newsroom. You know, you know what the stories are. Grab them, put, put them up. And that's exactly what we do, and, and these are examples. This is um, an example of an innovation scape for one of the world's largest food companies. We built a, and this is the marketers and the PR team, built an innovation scape that basically has members of the company coming into the platform to share ideas and to collaborate. And then this group takes them and anything that's really sounds like a, a great idea, it's researched, prototyped, and then tested in the business and in the company's business environment. And if it works through the test, sometimes it's even shared on the outside with the consumer. So this has the potential. The relationships and the collaboration within this internal platform actually helps the business in terms of innovation, and, and that's, of course, one of their major goals, tying your goals back to the, the business. This is another um, WordPress PR people all over this. They built a whole social media center, lots of news in here, blogging going on, updating. These are all a part of our daily activities. And, you know, it's simple for us to say, client says, you know, could you change my flash on the home page? Could you update my news and on the the side there, oh, we have a new let newsletter, you know, you guys are involved, of it, j involved, get it up there, send it out. We do it all. And it's a great feeling. This is a new role, and we're busy, and that's the good thing. So what do we have here? We have this new hybrid of professional, definitely um, vital, active, busy. We're social media influencers because we're learning the landscape, we're climbing up the ladder so that we can understand the dynamics and educate. We become market analysts in a sense because when you're really listening, when you go into that conversation prism, start pulling out the conversations, you understand what your market needs, where they are, and what they're going to require from you, whether it's in terms of customer service or thought leadership. So we're the market analysts and experts. We blend with the web marketers, and, and that's a good thing. There's a lot of integration between the PR and the web marketing. Same voice, we're on the same page, everything is consistent, it really supports the brand. Customer service, well, we should have been doing that all along, but even more so now, we're all customer service representatives. We are going to hear things. As we're listening and we're monitoring, we can't keep it to ourselves. We can't work in a vacuum anymore. We need to pass things to customer service. We need to pass things over to R&D because we're going to get information that's going to, going to help develop a better product or service. Relationship marketers, I think PR people have been that all along. Okay. Um, we basically, we're great at relationships. 
our job was always to build relationships to bring long-term value to the to the company social media landscape lets us do more of this really lets us excel in relationship building we're viral marketers we're understanding that sometimes you can take a great viral piece and whether it's passion or education or it's a nonprofit cause that you know tugs on the heartstrings or maybe it is funny but as long as it supports the brand in some way great viral marketers and and we're listeners and we're listeners so that we ourselves can become conversationalists it's not so necessarily the brand of course you want your brand connecting but you personally want to be connected so that you can be the influencer yourself the language changes so this is all about change whether you see it evolution or revolution when I'm in the social media landscape and I'm connecting whether it's my favorite bloggers or it's um, you know someone who is just like me it's an I'm peer-to-peer -peer. I took off my marketing hat I'm not pitching you don't have to pitch if you're listening because honestly you would understand what what people are saying there's no audiences we don't talk in terms of audience that's very broad and mass and messages well that just implies your broadcast messaging and that's that bye-bye push we've got our pull method now and we can listen carefully and I just I put a brief list because you want to listen you want to identify the right people so that you have brand champions to move your stories through and whether you find them through Technorati or Ice Rocket or hey go to All Top it's one of the greatest places Guy Kawasaki and AllTop.com it's the biggest online magazine rack go find your interests and look at all the top bloggers and, and what they're saying it's really a great place to find out who's talking about what types of products or services or interests uh, check out blog roles for for influencers you know listen to use backtype so you can get into comments and, and hear what certain people are saying so these are all big changes very exciting but mostly this is about public relations and this is about you know what in order to qualify to participate empathy I want to be the person that I want to reach if I'm in a community I want to connect with you and with you because I'm not dear to the marketer I'm not here to sell you my books or my company no I want to I want to help you I want to talk to you and it's very reciprocal so there's a lot of empathy mention the market expertise really get a great understanding of the competitive language you have your relevant stories always true intentions always looking out for your customer and helping them basically observing and you know what you're experiencing too. experience those online tools because as someone who wants to be an influencer and wants to keep their brands ahead of everybody else you have to understand the, the technology that's involved so you know you tell me whether you think it's evolution it's revolution whatever it is in your heart you have to be a part of it and that's really important and it's all of you sitting right there what you do every single day that makes the difference so I thank you very much for being an attentive audience and I would be happy to take your questions oh okay right here in, in the 2.0 um, environment, is negative like opinions that are expressed either by your fans or your you know, customers, is there less fear in public relations now than there used to be? Because before it was like, oh my gosh, you said mm -hmm. you respond, you react, but this right. time you kind of left that and you created, is, that, is there less fear now? I guess? Such a great question because I guess it depends on the industry and the company. For me, less fear. Um, I take that as a great form it's a gift <laughs> it's feedback I can make a better product a better service it's interesting and I'll tell you a personal story you know last night I did a, a Skype video from my hotel room I was speaking to some executives at a they're, they're all at blog world expo and I was going over the internal brand champion community building turning your um, employees into champions a lot of it has to do with I tie everything to business you know I got my MBA and a lot of the way that I see PR it, it has to make sense with your overall business goals and some of the things that I was saying somebody tweeted out you know too much biz, biz speak I wish you had broken it down 
I thought that was the greatest thing that you could ever say to me. I DM'd her afterward and I said, thank you. And if, you know what, I, and I told her, I said, it's got to be my, the MBA in me. Um, and next time it's going to make me think more about who I'm speaking with. That's a good thing. You know, there's always going to be um, people who may not want to bridge over to your side. And there are some trolls out there that you're not going to, no matter, you don't even waste your breath trying to change their minds. And eventually it does move on. But I see the negative feedback as a way to actually get somebody back. If you listen and then you engage and try to get somebody back into your camp, it can only help the brand. Yes? You raised a good question. How do you tell the difference between the one-off oral curmudgeons versus a serious influencer? Because I look at the 80-20 rule, you know, are they going to stop what you're doing and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of time and effort to try to change this one little curmudgeon versus is there a better Right, that's usually an, an evaluation that you have to make, and it is a great question. Um, the troll, you can just look at their stream. You can just see that everything, if, you're, if you have a troll on Twitter, and I've had one, um, you know, I, I knew immediately that when I looked at all the things that the troll was saying, they weren't, I felt like I was in good company because they weren't just bashing me, they were bashing some very smart, social media savvy individuals who I look up to. So you can see the difference. When you identify that, that's when you say no. But if, if there seriously is an influencer, and whether he's in your industry or somewhere else, you know, you do want to take the time. Because you can go and you, you can find an influencer on, on Technorati. You can see how they, where they are, their rankings in a, a blog search engine. You can see by the, the community that they've built, the, the people that are following them. So there's certain ways, it's identifying authority and ranking to say. But how do you know if who's following them is part of your audience? I mean, someone may be a very high influencer, but they're talking to people I don't care about. We, Right. We generally listen in the community to see how much this is going to affect our efforts, our brands. We always, there's a time when if you're feeling that it's not really going to affect your efforts moving forward and this is just something that is going to pass, you always put the right information out. I mean, it, you should because you, you want to make sure that <coughs> If it's a community that is harmless, and if they are talking about you, then chances are you might want to spend a little time. This could be a new camp. This could be a new group that could promote your brand. It, this, our conversation, and I would love to take it offline with you, is fascinating, and there are a lot of choices to be made, but I, I would like to maybe talk to you separately. I think it's a great question, I, and I thank you for asking it. Yes. In the traditional model of press releases, we would always charge a flat fee for that. With this paradigm switching now, do you find a retainer base uh, is a better way to go since you're constantly making these updates as opposed to billing on an hourly basis? So That's a great question too. Um, what we're doing, because you're right, your SMRs, they are stories, and you can post them as frequently as you like. So we always tell our clients they're, they're going to get more value in the retainer. And yes, we do. We, we would say you will, we never, you can't really pinpoint it to a number because you never really know how many exciting stories or, or things that you're going to be doing. And it's true, if you did every single one on a flat fee, that could get expensive. So I think the retainer is a, a much better approach. Although, you know, your wire service, you pay a flat fee for your PR 2.0 enhanced news release. So they do it, but you know what, if your agency can do it and you can get value and you can get many, you know, nobody's looking at the, you know, the numbers. It, it's more the, the quality of what you're doing. You integrated your creative services, mm -hmm. your PR services. That's what we do. And that's okay. Yeah, that's exactly what we do.
Anybody else? Oh, right there. Let me see if I understand the question. So when you say shut it down, do you mean that because there are consumers talking about a brand's products on a, maybe a Yelp or a Get Satisfaction? What are you posting on there on its company site? And I think shut it down is not a good approach. <laughs> not at all. And, I, and Jeremiah, Jeremiah Aoyang did a wonderful post on the five ways that companies let employees participate in social media. And the first two ways are ways that I definitely don't recommend, but the first way was, we're clueless, do whatever you want, you know, no guidelines, no rules. And the second way is shut it down. We are fearful, we want to protect the brand, we want to protect the employees, but guess what? It's going to go on anyway. The conversations are, are going to happen. Even if you go to the limits of shutting down social networks within your own company, your employees are going to go home and be on social networks, and, and conversations are going to be there anyway. So I don't recommend it. Big brands, small brands, you know, people, customers want to connect with their brands because they feel a sense of open honesty, transparency. Shut it down and control your, your message. No, we, we can't have that anymore. So I'm not sure if I answered your question. Now I understand it. Did you want to add to it, or does that sort of help you out? No, no shutting it down. <laughs> OK. Anyone else? OK, well, I think, oh. It's my favorite question yes. to ask a lot of our speakers is, what, what do you see is next? I mean, what's, I, it's a question we get a lot. What, what's down the pipe, and what should we be looking for? What patterns? Uh, both as nonprofits and as businesses, that uh, what advice would you give us to be prepared for that next wave? What is next? Oh boy, great question. Well, you know we're going to see how technology changes. I mean, we were talking about Brian and, and cloud computing, so it's very important that we all stay on top of those trends, um, and that means that we are. I just know this in in PR. Every single service provider that comes out with anything that is a new type of monitoring, new type of measurement, new ways to reach people, you need to demo it. You need to talk to them to understand it. Bring it to your clients be, before you ask. Um, I think the whole idea of you know, moving into this third generation, um, so the semantic web where search is going to be made easier because it will be done by machines rather than humans is a very interesting idea bringing meaning and making it quicker so that we can be more of counselors and strategists. <laughs> I, I find the whole Google side wiki, I love that. I think we're going to see a tremendous, once that catches on, PR people are going to be, well, we're never going to sleep, but that's okay. <laughs> that's all right. So, you know, I guess if I could just say it's to be, we're going to see a lot of technology where we have to then figure out our strategy, and strategy is very important. So whether it's one, two, three, being on top of the strategy, being on top of the technology so that we can better connect through our strategy, our planning, <laughs> our measurement, that's what's going to be key for us. Okay? Anything else? All right. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure.